The Last Word with Stan Collymore. Stan Collymore! Oh, yes. Telling it as it is. Instead of tweeting and putting on Instagram that Collymore's this and Collymore's that, go and tell us. No holes barred. Oh, Stan. Pure, unadulterated Collymore. And Stan Collymore strikes. Right, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by uh, a, a man uh, that is here in his domain at, here at, uh, at, at Manor House Stables, and we'll come to uh, the future and what you're doing now. Michael Owen joins me. Michael, um, I like doing these interviews because I like looking at specific parts of somebody's life or somebody's career. So I want to go back to you being the kid. I remember um, you as a, a, a 16, 17-year-old at, at, at Liverpool, and everybody spoke about you in the dressing room, senior pros. This kid is special, he's quite incredible, you know, he scores goals for fun. Um, when you made your debut at Wimbledon, uh, was your, your first goal at Wimbledon away, uh, alongside me, um, did you treat senior football with the same disdain, if you like, that you did junior football because at junior football you just scored goals for fun you were everybody knew you scoring goals for under uh, I mean before YouTube um, Michael Owen he scored 16 goals for the <laughs> under 15s and this kid is going to be special when you make your senior debut did you just think yeah I'm going to go and score goals and do exactly the same things I did at junior level well you think it and you hope it um, but I'd be lying if I didn't say that every single level that you that you progress at um, of course you've got that small percentage of intrepidation what's it going to be am I going to be able to play alongside a Stan Collymore I mean I'd never answered these questions before okay I broke virtually every record at every level and then even then playing with men you know going from youth team at Liverpool into the reserves which back in the day as, as we know was for players that weren't in the first team you had to play in the reserves that was part of it so the likes of me Carragher David Thompson you know there was three or four of us that would get put into the reserves to play alongside whoever wasn't in the first team at the time. Now, that was an amazing learning curve. Of co- it only lasted 10 games for me or something like that, and then I was fast-tracked into the first team. But did but- you know that you were going to be fast-tracked? I mean, you must, that, that's, that's the nub of the question, is that when you know that you can score goals at junior level and everybody is talking about you, and this kind of like su- is a superstar in waiting... When you've only played 10 games in the reserves and you get dragged into the dressing room that has John Barnes, that has, you know, a young Jamie Carragher that you, you obviously know very well, uh, Patrick Berger, Robbie Fowler. Is, is there any nerves? Because I didn't detect from you anything other than, yeah, I score goals, I win games. Um, it, it doesn't matter whether it's England, it doesn't matter whether it's Liverpool, it doesn't matter if it's uh, an under-15 team. And that's quite an unusual trait for such a young kid. It is, but... I mean, playing in the, those reserve games, I went straight from kids' football into the men's football and, and played and, and continued to score goals. So I knew straight away that I can play with men. And that was a massive psychological sort of uh, thing to overcome. I was so respectful for play, with players, you know, with, with of course, yourself and, and, you know, this Liverpool team were, were so famous, so good, so, so many good players. I knew deep down that I would be one of you, you know, eventually. I didn't know whether I'd take to it straight away and whether I'd score goals straight away. And I was, I was always brought up to be sort of, you know, I, I'm a massive believer in a hierarchy as well. You know, I, I would never come onto the team coach and I would always sort of sit down last just in case someone, I was sitting in someone's space. I didn't want to have a mobile phone. I didn't, certainly didn't want to drive a nice car so anyone could look at me and point the finger. So I was massively respectful. Where did that and come almost from? in awe. Where almost did that come in from? Well, just the way I was brought up, you know, and, and the way football was, you know, football would have a, uh, you know, a, a definite hierarchy in it and people would slap you down if you were doing anything too fast. And the, the problem for me was that I was motoring fast throughout my career. All of a sudden I was from nothing to first team and then almost first team regular and then golden boot winner in my as a 17 year old in my first year it was like so almost I was achieving as much if not more as other people in my team however I still wanted to keep the the same values and still be very respectful and still almost put myself down to the outside world but obviously within still knew that I was, you know, I was capable of, of doing what everyone else was doing. Were you ever phased? Because you mentioned that sort of meteoric rise of going from, 
in double quick time, you know, playing at underage groups for England, breaking into the Liverpool first team. I remember you coming on at Wimbledon and it was just a case of it, it, when you're going to score. Latched on to ball, uh, down at Sellers Park, you score and then you're off and running. And then, of course, you, you, you get a golden boot and you're still a teenager and then you're dragged into the England national team. Were you aware at any of these phases, particularly going to Liverpool, one of the world's biggest football clubs, the oldest national football association in the world, England, of which you've scored many goals in, we'll come to a particularly famous one shortly. Were you aware of the size of these organisations or were you too young to appreciate how fast this journey was going? Yeah, I probably think too young to appreciate and just had a relentless mindset of, you know, I always felt like I was better, you know, in under 15s, as you say, I broke the all time England goal scoring record in under 16s. And the set, I, I just broke virtually every record I possibly could. And I must admit, I thought I was the best player, you know, about in my age group. In fact, at 15, I thought I was the best player in the world at my age group. I probably was at nine, yeah, I probably were. was at 10, I probably was at 11. I probably was right the way through. I was probably the best 17 year old in the world. Then all of a sudden, you play in the in the national, you know, in, you now against, as soon as you turn 17, 18, you're in the first team. Now it's not your age group anymore. Now you've got to prove that you're the best. And there's 18, 19, 30, 32 year olds. You, you know, you're open into a wide world then. So was there anything that dented that, this kind of like ring of steel around you, this ring of iron that went, I'm the best. I'm 15, 17, 18, I know I'm the best. Was there anything that started to dent it as you climbed the levels, like I say, Liverpool and, and, and particularly yeah, but World Cups in England? Yes, not until, you know, I was 23, 24. That's when questions started because you can't kid yourself. You know, yes, you can have an inflated ego, you can have an inflated opinion of yourself. And maybe that can sort of rise 10, 20% if you are a big headed little so-and-so, which on the outside I wasn't, but on the inside core I was. You know, I used to go on that pitch looking down at players, even though I was looking up at everybody because I was so small. Um, so of course I had that attitude, no question about it. And until I was about 23, 24, in my mind, and of course it's probably not true. I've, well, I won a Ballon d'Or in one year, but I mean, I in my say, mind... You're doing yourself a bit of a disservice because no, you mind, I was won everything there is, is to win. So in, 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 you, you mentioned 23, but I want to drag you back to 17, 18. Is that, was, was there anything that dented the perception that you had of yourself at that stage? Was there anything? Was there any injuries then? Were there any players that you thought, shit, he is very good. Uh, can I get to that level? Because... I chatted to Gary Lineker last year, and he was, the, and I've mentioned this to you before, he was the exact opposite. He didn't know if he could score goals at Leicester, in Leicester reserves. He didn't know if he could score goals in the old first division or in La Liga or for England. And he did. You were the opposite. You went into the mindset completely different. Two of England's great goal scorers with completely different mindsets on how to approach the game. So when you're 17 and 18, were there any doubts? No, none whatsoever. None whatsoever. I mean, the only doubts I had was when I became, you know, hit 23, 24 and other things happened. The only thing I remember is looking at one player and thinking, wow, actually there's, there's someone there that I'm not sure I can be as good as. And that was Thierry Omri. He, when he came over, I believed, and of course there will be other great strikers, of course, in the, in the Premier League at the time, but I, I didn't watch anyone and think, Yes, there was certain things that people could do that I couldn't do, but I didn't think that anybody was better than me, so to speak. But when Henri came on the scene, I thought, I'm not sure I can get to that level. He was a great player, but he, he initially didn't score goals, enough goals to be considered as a great sort of centre foot. But then as soon as he started adding goals to my game, I looked at him and thought, right. And that's when, not doubts, it wasn't him that caused doubts, but around then I was, and then I started picking up a couple of injuries then my powers were starting to wane slightly. And then you've got to be true to yourself. And I wasn't that, I, I lost that, you know, that feeling that I always had, that invincible feeling, that look of disdain towards anybody else in a nice way, as soon as you cross that white line. Um, but he, and around that period with a time when I started thinking, do you know what? I'm not the best player in the world, so to speak. And that's, that was my mindset at the time. Um, 
the goal against Argentina, a World Cup, a super, we, we already knew you in, in these shores. And like I say, people that had watched football had known you for quite a few years and they knew that you were going to score goals at every level. Um, again, I've asked you this question before, but in terms of detail for listeners and viewers, is that how, how much did that goal against Argentina change your life from the minute you scored it for the next 12 to 18 months? Well, it changed people's view towards me, I suppose. People were more interested in me. I th I'd like to think I didn't change at all. The only thing that made me change in a way was because now I had this attention, I was petrified of, of not fulfilling or, or matching people's dreams and hopes and, and aspirations for, for me. And I think that that comes... In my opinion, in a lot of sportsmen's career, for the first part of it, it's all fun, it's all great, it's all achievement, and as soon as you get all that, it's all great and you love it. But you get to a certain level at some point whereby you reach a pinnacle and you think, wow, now it's a now I, I went through a stage then it was petrified of not being able to do that anymore. So almost when I scored a goal, when I hit a you know a great target, when I scored a goal in the cup finals, it was not necessarily joy, it was relief that you know, no one else has done it and that I'm still the go-to guy and I'm still, you know, first pick and I'm still... All Did it those become things. less fun then? Yes, oh, 100%. You ask all the great sportsmen, let's say, that get to the very top of their level, you know, you look at Tony McCoy, that was the greatest jump jockey of all time, you look at Phil Taylor and Dart, the fun of actually winning a race or the fun of actually winning a game is not, not what it was right at the start. It's more, thank God for that, no one's taking my credit. It's a fear factor. You, you play now in fear that anyone else is going to be as good as you or better than so you. So when do you enjoy all of those things? When you retire? Well, do I you think sit so. back? Do you ever go, bloody hell, scoring goals in cup finals at Cardiff and great goals for Liverpool and you know, going to Real Madrid and Manchester United and Newcastle, all of these great moves and these great goals. If a lot of it was relief to maintain the level that you're at and the perceptions people have on you, when do you then enjoy it? Well, I was going to say you don't, but of course you do enjoy certain parts of that. So you score a great goal and of course there's joy and ecstasy, but the overriding feeling when all is said and done is, thank God for that. It's, it's, it's a relief. And I think only now you look back on your career and you look back on it with a pride, but you can also reflect on it and think to myself, wow, how much I loved football, like going on that pitch and just running around at players and just thinking, I'm better than you, I'm going to sprint past you, I'm going to score this goal. How many am I score, going to score today? That feeling, you know, gradually ebbs away and it becomes then, not a job, but it becomes something that is almost more of a pressure, more so than, than just going out with a free spirit. I know for a fact, you know, that I scored that goal against Argentina when I was 27, if I look back on that, it was absolutely impossible I could score that goal again as a 27 year I, I'm purely, not physically, I couldn't have scored it physically, but just from a mental point of view, I was absolutely fearless. As an 18 year old, I didn't even know who I was playing against, I didn't care who I was playing against. They were petrified of me, and that was my attitude. I didn't want that, I didn't, it just happened. And that's the beauty of youth, of course, as I say, when I'm 27, I'm looking back thinking, how on earth did you like have that? How can you even bother trying to run at someone like that? You know, it's, it's just something that you, you have naturally as a youngster and, and just wish that I could have bottled it and had that same you know, attitude throughout my career. What were the immediate after effects of, uh, effects of scoring that goal? Because again, I remember you, you saying to me that you spoke to your dad and uh, he said, you know, life's going to change now. Um, was that a warning? Did you sit up and go, crikey, Dad's said this to me. What were the real tangible things that happened to you in that next 12 months that were a massive change from before scoring that goal? Well, first of all, it came within seconds of the final whistle. And I was getting players coming up to me. I always remember Paul Merson and players well, like that. I remember Merson on the, on the side when he scored yeah. it. Yeah, I know. Everybody was on the bench and like, where does that come from? And he just came and sat by me in the dressing room. It was just, it was almost like, wow, mate, wow, 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 <laughs> mate. I mean, you don't even realize, oh my God, my, wow. And, and he just almost, and I was thinking, oh my God, this is like Paul Merson. He's almost telling me that life is, do you realize what you just did? Did you, what a goal? And he was almost struggling for words. 
And then even a couple of other players were just saying, mate, you're, this is changing that's your it. life. And I was sort of sat there thinking, yeah, I scored a great goal, but I didn't realise all this. And then, you know, we get to the airport the next day, you know, we're flying back on Concord and the, you know, they asked me to go up in the cockpit to land with the uh, flag out the window and things like that. Then I came back home in a car and, and as soon as I drive onto the estate, onto our housing estate, you know, the, the streets were lined with all the locals and with press, cameramen, all people like that. And then just getting in my car, just driving anywhere. There was a convoy behind me, you know, for a good few weeks after I couldn't play golf with my dad without seeing everyone rustling in the bushes, cameramen just following me everywhere. Were you ever scared or did you embrace it? I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. I didn't, I don't mind, you know, if, if, if there's an organized interview or, you know, or you're in training or something and these things are happening, then absolutely fine. But going down to play nine holes of golf with my dad and just having like 10 people just literally walking around following us, I hated every minute of it. But that was obviously a, a thing that was, that was going to gradually subside and it did. Um, but I didn't like it at all. The pro. Um, your book has come out and it's been, it's like you've thrown a hand grenade in and people have gone, Michael Owen's thrown a hand grenade in. How fucking cool is that? Um, <laughs> Newcastle, you were, you were blunt, you were on it. And I like that. And I think that most people like that. Trust me. They're, they're like people that are, this is what happened then and giving insight. And that's what we try to do. What was it particularly about Newcastle United going from, again, you've played for, I think, the three biggest clubs in the world in Manchester United, Real Madrid and Liverpool. What was it about the experience of being at Newcastle that you didn't enjoy? Because I think a lot of people have taken, extrapolated things, haven't read the book, taken things out of context, if you said, and they've got, he doesn't like Newcastle, he doesn't like Geordies, which of course is a load of bollocks. But you're going from a huge club in Real Madrid where there is always ultra expectation of elite level athletes to being, you are going to be the difference for us moving forward at Newcastle United. Did that have its own pressures that you didn't like to be the man that is going to bring the glory back to a, a club that hadn't won anything since I think the Fairs Cup in 1969? Um, and what, what was particularly, what did you not enjoy about that whole experience? Well, going there, was uh, was exciting. I mean, Alan Shearer was there, obviously the the uh, the king of Newcastle, and I, of course I thought playing there for a season with him would be just amazing. Then taking over that mantle, and of course, as a, a big head little so and so, you think you know I'm going to be the person to bang in the goals, to be the famous number nine, etc. All the right intentions. When even when you're actually just asking that question, I'm I'm sort of stewing on it, thinking, do you know what? With all those things that you've just said. It was never, ever going to be, you know, one of those things that potentially was going to work. I mean, just go with, just being that type of player that, uh, that, that but then go into a, a club that was never, ever going to win anything, yeah. really, you know, if we're all realistic about it, was never going to be. And, and of course, as well, everybody knew that I wanted to go back to Liverpool. I was, you know, there was no secrets there and I make no apologies for that. I mean... Alan Shearer did it himself. He was desperate to go back to his hometown club. You know, there's loads of people that have done it. And in fact, I think that's to be applauded. So certainly I'm not going to apologize for that. So no matter what, whoever, it could have been West Ham. It could have been Notts Forest. It could have, it could have been anybody. And sadly for me, it just happens to be Newcastle that are sort of bearing the brunt of all this fallout. But they were always going to be, whoever I signed for was always going to be my second choice. So did you, did you think it through? Because I have you down as somebody that is, and Gary Neville mentioned this in his interview, about the, the times that he has done things off the cuff, spontaneously, whether that be in business or whether that be going to Valencia to be manager, is that when it's exploded in his face? When he does things methodically and says, sits down, whether it be with an advisor or your family, and you say, I'm going to go here for this reason, ah, but is that the right place to go at this right time? Did you think that moved through before and properly? We absolutely did. And we even to the extent. So, I mean, I had two options at the end. Liverpool came in, 8 million bid. President comes to me and says, listen, you're not going to Liverpool. You're going to Newcastle for 16 million. That's what they've bid. Or you stay in here. Because they want the extra money. Of course. They wanted to buy Sergio Ramos at the time. And I think they needed the money to, to fund that. So I'm sat there thinking, World Cup end of the year, my wife is desperate to go home. She was sickened by, you know, the whole 
process and you know living in a hotel for four or five months and me being away for four or five days of the week and foreign country not being able to drive in that you know wrong side of the road and having a two-year-old it was very very difficult for my wife and totally understand that but so she was obviously putting pressure on me to to come back home I was thinking I've got to play for England in the World Cup you know I can't be a, a sub at Real Madrid and I'm sure we'll be buying players I think you know Rabinho and players mm-hmm. like that were just signed I was thinking cool am I going to play here so once the Liverpool option had, had gone and you're thinking, you're hoping that, you know, a big club are going to come in and all the rest of it, you settle down to think, right, what are the options here? And it boiled down to Newcastle or staying at Real Madrid. Now, with all due respect, and I said it in the book, I thought going to Newcastle, having played at Liverpool and Real Madrid, was, you know, I'm now going to a club that aren't in Europe, that, you know, it's, it's, it's not one of the big clubs of the world, and I was still right at the top of my game. So I thought, I can't, you know... I it's not a big enough stage for me at this stage of my career, pure and simple. But with that, with that decision, are you always then setting yourself up to fail? Because essentially you're an elite level athlete that's been used to dining <coughs> at the top table. By your own admission, you're saying Newcastle can't compete at the kind of level that I've been used to. So if you go into that move with that mindset, then it's always going to be very difficult for you. And exactly. And when you were saying, when you were asking the question before, I was almost you know, running through, running through that in my mind thinking, do you know what? It was always sort of destined because if you've got that attitude, um, then it's, it's always going to be tricky. And of course I knew that I knew sort of going down a level, so to speak, in terms of the quality of players and, and the position in the league, um, might affect me. So what we decided, what was almost a compromise was to sign for Newcastle to agree to Newcastle, but put it in the contract that I could sign for Liverpool for a set fee mm in the summer in the following summer and then the following summer for another set fee so almost in my mind made me think okay let's give it a bash let's go and do it and you're dead right and the way it happens is as soon as you go to a club and you start training I mean I vividly remember it started training I thought wow you know I'm I'm playing on a different level with all due respect I'm I'm better than this I'm I'm training and I could feel the lads thinking bloody hell look what we've just had you know I wouldn't give the ball away. I'd score loads in training. I was just, I was at the top of my game. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not ashamed of that. So, you shouldn't be because no. that's, 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 this is the insight that's, into yeah, what we do about athletes. Is it's that hard to say People don't stand. understand. They see everybody going to a dressing room. They see everybody wear the same shirt and they feel that everybody's singing from the same hymn sheet. But you're going in at a level that the others play blatantly aren't at that point. But the hardest thing is, is sat here and almost, I can't give you the true answer unless I actually put things into perspective. And when I put things into, in, into perspective, I feel like I'm being almost big-headed or saying I'm playing at a different level. No, that's not that's, me. I don't that's feel... That's a British I, attitude of, okay. of keep your head down and... But if I don't of, say that, if I don't sort of tell you exactly where I am in my mind, then you will never understand my mindset and, and sort of... And, and that's, that's the God's honest truth. I was, you know, I recently won the Ballon d'Or. I was banging goals. And I was on at the top of my game... The thing is, I don't care whether you're, you know, so self-motivated, it's untrue. You can stay ahead of the game for a month. You can stay ahead of the game for two, three months maybe. But when you're consistently training with players at a slightly lesser level, eventually, eventually, whether, as I say, it's a month or a year or whatever, eventually you start slipping a little bit yourself. And it's the flip side of it that when you're a young kid coming into a team with high quality players, that your levels go up. Oh, absolutely. I could give you so many, so many examples of bang average players that have made unbelievable careers just because they're at a club that they just dragged, they're dragged into the first team because there's so many great players around them and they almost like, they can't fail to improve and to learn on the job and it's almost sink or swim you'll be able to name millions of them and they're just the right place the right time and of course that was a decision for me at the end of my career going to Manchester United as my performances and physical ability is now on the wane thinking do you know what if I go to United I'm going to be training with Giggsy and Scholesy and all these players that's going to bring me right I mean how embarrassing if Michael Owen can't compete with these so I'm on it every day in training and my level is you know, right, okay, I can't sprint as quick as that. That's never going to change because my physic. But in terms of preparing for training sessions and, you know, wanting it and being ready and whatever, 
absolutely, I need to be right on the, the, the lad's level. And I'm capable of it. I've just not been at that level for a few years because of surroundings. And that's, the, the hard thing is, I can't say any of this without it feeling like it's going to be a criticism towards Newcastle. I have got no problem with them. This is just a situation. I lived there for four years. All this helicopter every day back into, load of bollocks. I mean, yes, I owned a helicopter. Yes, it was for my family to come and watch me play. Yes, if I had a day off, I might pop home to see my family. But I lived there. I mean, a year after I left, I still had a house there. And let's it be was... perfectly honest, elite level athletes don't become elite level athletes by cutting corners. No, and, and I'm, as I should say, I mean, but the, the problem is in all of this, when I'm trying to be honest and trying to say it how it is, no matter what, it all comes out as a negative towards Newcastle. But it's not the people, the place, the stadium. Everything was great. Loved it. The simple fact is that I was just, in my opinion, slightly above that level at that time. And sadly, my level then starts to slip. Then you get a few disgruntled fat. Then you get injuries. Then all of a sudden, this snowball... And it's almost an inevitability to, to what we were saying before that it just isn't going to work. And then as soon as I do get injured and I hear the fans singing what a waste of money, my own fans think then that obviously turns me... Did that upset you? Oh. I well, mean, I'm real upset because I, again, the interviews that I do with people that have been at the very top, the Teflon, they, they, they process things in a very different way to, to Joe Bloggs in terms of... Uh, I know what I can do. This is how good I am. And I really don't care what... The, because you can't afford to care what people think. Did you care at what people think yeah. at, at, at that stage? Because that would have been a first for you. At Liverpool and at Real Madrid, you wouldn't have had that. Yeah. I mean, listen, if I fobbed it off, if I ever thought, you know, if I ever cheated anyone, I, I you know, that would, be, that would be that. But I know for a fact that I'm wired to be competitive. I'm wired to be loyal to people. I've had the same wife. I've been going out, I've been together with my wife since we were blooming three years old. I had the same agent <laughs> right the way through my career, the same boot sponsor right the way through my career, the same friend, my best mate I was in school with an infant. I mean, I'm the most loyal person in the world. And how anyone can say otherwise, I tr I've always tried my best. Look at, oh, my, look at my record. Every big game I've ever played, I scored in. Everyone, like everyone, every cup final I ever played in. One, you know, I would run through brick walls, but I've never not tried. I've always been, you know, honest and open and happy and, and a popular member of a. But when you're doing all this, and when you actually get injured at White Hart Lane, trying to score a goal for the Geordies, trying to, and bear in mind the run we had been on since I signed, and we were scoring. Me and Shearer, I'd scored a load of goals. We went, we were bottom of the league when I signed. When I got mm. injured on New Year's Eve, we were right up, you know, in near the European places. So we were flying along and I'm putting my foot in where it hurts on behalf of Newcastle and I break my foot. Then I come back and I play in the last game or two of the season. You know, naturally, it does take a bit of time for your broken bone to heal. Mm. Six and then weeks of course, at least. Yeah, and then, of course, you know, I play the last couple of games, go to the World Cup, do my knee. I'm out for a year. So there's virtually 18 months that I'm out. But it was all for Newcastle. It was all for Newcastle. I would try my best. I got hurt for Newcastle. And then in that period of time, something happened, whether I wasn't as, you know, whether I didn't do enough interviews in the local papers to say I'm desperately trying to get, or whatever. But I was so focused. I even paid for my own physio to get back as strong and as good as ever. I mean, so I was doing everything in my power to get back. And then as soon as you come back into the team and within a couple of games... You know, you run into your own player that you don't see, he smacks your jaw and you're knocked unconscious and you get carried off unconscious. And then to hear that, to hear what I heard from my own fans, what a waste of money. I mean, I was mortified and that's just like, to me, and I know it was a minority and all the rest of it, but, you know, it's all right for people to have a pop at me, but it's a two-way thing as well. You've got to love the fan, they've got to love you, you know, you, they've got to show that you're playing for them and vice versa. And, uh, and that hurt, that like, big big you know I don't know what the right word was but hurt my pride a lot because I've never ever experienced anything like that you and Alan Shearer two huge you made your Liverpool debut alongside me and I made my England debut alongside Alan Shearer two incredible athletes two incredible goal scorers very good friends you played with each other for, for club and for country what happened 
that manifested itself in a Twitter spat? What, what was the timeline? Where did you become disappointed with him? Where did he become frustrated with you? Well, he became frustrated at me, apparently, and I only learned about a year after I lo uh, left Newcastle that he was disappointed or he thought that I didn't really want to play in the last game of the season, which again goes back to this mythical thing that, that Newcastle fans have against me at the minute. And of course, it stems from, you know, the old physio um, and, and Alan, I guess, saying certain things. And The difference is, though, fans wouldn't know what the situation with you. You and Alan were very good mates. So why, yeah. would, he, why would he think that? If you're good mates and you're communicating, one of the reasons you go to Newcastle United is because of him. Um, well, and, and that's why I didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue. And you know the story. Aston Villa, last game of the season, I've got a groin injury. Day before, I'm, you know, I've not trained for a week and it's, let's try to push it because it's the last game. Who cares? We need to stay up. So I'm sprinting away, trying to sprint. And I get to about 70% with a physio and Listen, Stan, you know I've had yeah. 25 muscle injuries in my career. I know what it feels. I know what my body is. I don't care what a scan or a doctor or a physio says. I know when I'm nearly fit. I know when I'm going to injure myself. I know I've done it. I've probably been the most, you know, player that's pulled the most muscles in, in the history of football. So no one can tell me where I am with an injury. I knew I was about four or five days away from starting to train, really. And I was sprinting or trying to sprint. And I said to the physio, listen, if I push it to... Any it's going to go. Days, it's going to go. Went in. Physio relayed it to Alan. Spoke. To, I went into the into his office. He called me in, and uh, and as you say, big mates stayed at his house when I was house hunting. Signed for Newcastle partly because of him. You know, played golf with him most time. We, we were great mates. But did you have to? And again, a lot of people can't get their head around the fact your colleagues, your teammates, you score goals together. You're the two biggest English striking names since Gary Lineker. But now he's your boss. So he has to wear a different hat and you go in as virtually an employee. Yeah. Did, did that change the, the, the... A little bit, but we still spoke as mates. Um, and when I went into him, it was like, you know, Al, I can't, I don't feel as if I can start. You, you'll be pulling me off after five minutes. I'll have torn my groin. What I would do if I were you, but it's your call, obviously you're the man at your call. I think if you put me on the bench and we need to nick a goal with 10, 15, 20 to go, throw me on. It's a risk. I might do it but I'll just loiter. I'll just, you know, goal hang. I'll, and if a chance comes, obviously, hopefully, a chance drops at my feet and I'll be able to score. But I think it's a risk. O over to you, your sort of call. So what did he say? He, that's exactly what he did. That was that. I walked out the room, thought nothing of it. We played the game. I was on the bench, just thought absolutely fine. He's listened to what, you know, my body was telling him in a way, brought me on exactly as we, we needed a goal. I can't remember how long to go, quarter of an hour or something. And uh, got into the dressing room after, all mortified. We lost 1-0. And that was that. It was like everyone was gutted. Back up to, to Newcastle. Let's come in the next day and discuss next season. Obviously, I was uh, on a Bosman then. So that was that. We all left, shook each other's hands. Have a great summer, everyone. It was only about a couple of months later, I was speaking to a mate of mine, a mutual friend. I said, oh, I've got to give Alan a call about this. And he's, he's just said, don't bother. I was like, what do you mean? And that's when he said, listen, he's not happy with you. I said, well, what? He, oh, he, th he thinks you didn't, you know, you didn't want to play. You didn't want to risk yourself in case you got injured and blah, blah, blah. And none of this was intimated between the two of you, two good friends, between the final whistle at Villa Park and that guy telling you that? Absolutely nothing. No, absolutely nothing. I came on, I played, I tried obviously to score. We finished the game, everyone shook each other. So Alan said nothing to me ever. And then it was my mate that said that. And I thought, wow. And that was that. So obviously he didn't call him. Then I'm on uh, BT Sport, you know, a while after. And, and I knew we weren't talking. So end of that was like, so there was just no communication. You, you, you weren't tempted to just message him or call him? Well, I Al did. Yeah, I did. I said, a mate of mine said this. And, um, you know, but it was just sort of, it was almost confirmation that we're not, you know, we're not big mates anymore type of thing. And then I did a BT Sport open, honest interview um, with Jake Humphrey. And, and, and I said something along the lines of, I didn't enjoy um, that final six years of my career. And then I went on and kept saying, because I wasn't as good a player, my body was letting me down, blah, 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 put it into context. But Alan then chopped it off, stopped it where I said, didn't enjoy the last on the social media 
and then wrote underneath it, yeah, and you know, all this while you're on this money. So it basically made it look as if, as if I said, I hated playing football for the last six years. Have you career. spoken to him? No. Do you want to speak to him? I've not got any, I thought it was a sly dig at me. Well, it was a sly dig at me, which is why I retaliated with what I did on Twitter. Um, and that's, that's sort of the end of it. We've not, you know, had any, anything since on social media. We've not spoken to each other. I've not got a, pro as, as much as, you know, I thought he had a sly dig at me. Apart from that, I've got no problem with him. I believe it's him that's got the, you know, the issue with me thinking I didn't run through a brick wall for him. So probably. playing devil's advocate, do you think that with his manager's hat on, he's under pressure, it's his club, his city, he gets the, the, the tag of getting, be, being the manager that gets relegated. Do you think as the biggest player at the club, um, the most famous player at the club, the player that he could rely on or he thought he's going to bed picking a team the night before Villa, I can rely on Emma, we're mates that rightly or wrongly, he felt let down. I can totally understand the way he can come to a conclusion because I'd be the same. If something went wrong and all those reasons you just said, I mean, his status, everything else, and now it looks like he's failed, you know, in keeping him up and everything else like that. If I were him, I would think, well, I've done all I can. It's not my fault. He's rubbish. He's rubbish. He didn't try. I, you know, and I used to do it the same. If I didn't score on a Saturday, it's not because of me. I get in the car and say to my dad, how crap's my strike partner? How crap's our right back? How bad's our... He's not creative. The difference enough. is, though, you're not good friends. No, you but, and Alan are no, good friends. No, but you, you, if you're right... And he is wired like I am. He's mentally nails. He got everything out of his career. You know, I mean, you think about his strengths. Yes. He didn't. He wasn't faster than everyone. He didn't have a great trick. He wasn't bigger than any... Brutally but, efficient brutally goal Brutally efficient. And it, a little bit like Harry Kane now. Yes. He, I mean, and yet he wipes the floor with everyone in terms of goals and everything else. So he is just the hard, mentally the hardest. But to get like that, you have to almost... You shirk, respond, you, you shirk blame. And I was the same. Never my fault. If you start blaming yourself, you start having negative thoughts. Everyone else's fault. Never mind. And I can understand that. So if he's sort of putting himself above and then thinking, right, it's not, it wasn't my fault. Michael didn't want to play. He wasn't good enough. Why did we sign? Of course you're going to, and that's natural. We all do that. And that's so why I appreciate it. And I get it. It's just painful for me that a big mate of mine is now, has, has almost used me as one of those scapegoats, I feel. Would you like to sit down with him at some point next week, come having a chat with Wrighty? Wrighty and I started together, well, he was already at Crystal Palace, I was a young kid, I very much looked up to him, very good friends, for, for many different reasons. And I dug him out, and he dug me out, and it got very unseemly on Twitter, as it can escalate very quickly. Next week, I'm going to sit down with him and have a, just an honest and open chat. Do you think the scope in the next months, weeks, years for you and Alan Shearer, two former good, good mates, two all-time England great strikers to sit down and put it all beside you. I know what will happen if that happened. I mean, he's very, very adamant and he's single-minded and, and all we would do, I, I know what would happen, we would sit there and we would just regurgitate what happened. And but life's come too to the, short, Michael. But we'd come to the same we're not, conclusion. We're not 20-year-old kids anymore or 30. But we'd come you? to the same conclusion. He would say, I didn't think you did. And I'd say, I did. And, and we'd just say, no, you didn't. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. Yes. That's all it would be. And we'd probably shake hands and say, right, well, let's agree to disagree. And because that's exactly, I, you know, I know how I felt. He has come to terms with it in his own way. All we would do is shake hands and say, you know, we'll, we'll talk again type of thing. And let's agree to disagree. That's all it would happen. You know, because I'm not going to change his mind now. He's certainly not going to change. I know how I felt before that game. And I know I'd run through a brick wall for anyone, in particular my mate, and in particular a, a whole host of fans that are, are desperate for you to do well. And forgetting all that, just to play football, just to score a winning goal or whatever, I would have, you know, that's always been what I've done. So I'm not going to change my mind. I know how I feel. And all we would do is shake hands and say, let's agree to disagree. I think that's an incredible insight into, into, again, what happens in a dressing room is that you've got 20, sometimes 30 alpha males and the hierarchy that you mentioned earlier is that the higher you go and the more standards that you demand of yourself, the more difficult it is to kind of see perceived weakness. I want to ask you one last question about football. Sir Alex Ferguson, you go to Manchester United late in your career and you mentioned about um, reinvigoration and maintaining standards score, you know, one of the iconic Manchester derby goals. Um, 
What did you find in that dressing room at Manchester United? The winning f- mentality, uh, arguably the world's most successful manager in terms of longevity, some of the characters in it. That um, What did you find? What did you see? What was different about that club? You mentioned the word mentality. And, and I go back to the, the, the people that have been very successful over a long period of time. It doesn't become you know, the joy of, of, uh, of winning all the time, it is looking over your shoulder and they're all thinking, right, Arsenal are good this season. Oh no, Chelsea are good this season. Liverpool are good, whoever it might be. And it's, it, they feel as if it's their trophy and we can't let that go to anyone else. Did and you it, like that? Did you like going into that mentality? Absolutely. I was, that's my mentality. That's, I was used to it. I was at Liverpool and we were trying to create that mentality and I'm sure there was a lot of people within the dressing room that had one, but it was, a, it was almost a, you know, a, over a long period of time trying to convert everybody to thinking like that but you, you go to some dressing rooms and of course mentality is survival or, or, or whatever it is and I just love going into a, a dressing room that absolutely is, is 100% you know it's just about winning they feel as if every trophy is theirs and anyone else win it's like oh no we've let our trophy go as opposed to like hoping and praying that it's going to be it's going to be their trophy at the end of the season and that's you know that comes over over time and obviously over over winning for many years. What did Sir Alec, what were the first things he said to you when he calls you up and he speaks to you? Because I know that he likes to speak to players and he knows the the arse end of everything about everybody, from injuries to family to what have you. So he, he, you're a known quantity. He would have known the qualities that you'd have brought. What was the key conversation when he wanted you to come to Manchester United? Well, Nicky Butt phoned me up. I was obviously big mates with Nicky from uh, from Newcastle. And he phoned me up and he said, uh, the gaffer's going to call you. And I was like, who's the gaffer? Well, I didn't know whether he meant, you know, There's the only old, one gaffer, one at, son. Yeah, exactly. I didn't know whether he meant the old gaffer at Newcastle or, or what. And uh, he said, Sir Alex is going to call you. I think he wants to sign you. And I was like, is he winding me up? Or anyway, true to his, and I, I was literally sat by the phone thinking, surely not. And Did then, you regress to being the 17 year old kid? Yeah. I mean, I was just watching my phone <laughs> for about 20 minutes. And told my wife, obviously, right, listen, this could happen. I don't know. I don't know if you... And then a private number came and I thought, oh, my word, it's him. And uh, answered the phone and, and there he was, Sir Alex, saying, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've been thinking and like you to like to come and have a chat with you, you know, potential of, of signing for, for Manchester United. And, of course, at that time, you know, it was, uh, it was amazing that a manager like that wanted me to be part of his plans. Um, I knew this, I knew Berbatov and Rooney were going to be the main two, but even that in pre-season and, and at the start of the season, I was playing plenty of games. Um, you mentioned the goal early on in my career against City, but I scored in the cup final that year when we beat Aston Villa 2-1. I scored a hat-trick in the Champions League away in Wolfsburg. I mean, it was a really good season. Um, but yeah, that feeling of, of a great manager like that. And I always remember the over about, over sort of overwhelming feeling was loads of things going for me oh 70,000 people watching every week the, the, the size they're playing in the Champions League again. all these different but I thought one thing training with great players I was thinking no I want to listen to a Sir Alex Ferguson team talk and it was did you ever get the hairdryer? no I didn't Sir Alex saves it for you know did you see it? certain players yeah I mean I saw him angry but I think one of the best things about Sir Alex is how he understands certain players he knows that he could have a go at some people and it would just crucify them. And he was the master of sort of having a go at somebody but getting his message to him. So say Nanny, you know, liked to dribble. And if he wanted him to pass it quicker, he would just look at Wayne Rooney and say, stop, you know, stop taking touches, you're passing. Because he knew Wayne, he could fire Wayne up no matter what. So if he ever wanted to get a message across to any player, more and often than not, he would just have a go at Rooney. You know, because that would help his performance and it almost, it wouldn't stop him from, well, it wouldn't, break another person's you know heart so to speak so the way he had a go at certain people but not others and he just knew every person inside out knew how to manage them all if you could pick one moment in your football career from being a kid to being at Liverpool Man United Real Madrid Bernabeu Anfield uh, Old Trafford and bottle it and take that feeling out and ask all of our guests this you could take that feeling out every now and again when you need a lift what would it be? FA Cup final. Liverpool against Arsenal. And to put it into perspective, of course, when we're growing up, FA Cup final's everything. You know, I used to dribble around trees, 
you know, smack the ball into our garage and run around the estate singing Michael Owens just scored in the FA Cup final for, you know, for Everton probably, as it was when I was a, as a, as a kid. Um, FA Cup final was everything. Family used to all come round, friends, big barbecue in the back garden. It was just... And to, to play against that side, Arsenal, the Invincibles, they were such a good team. Um, to be battered for 85 minutes in the heat. I went into the game really, really playing well. I mean, I was scoring loads of goals in the lead up to that game. I just knew, just give me one chance. And I will never, ever forget the feeling I had. I've had it before in terms of I felt confident and just give me the ball, I'll score it any time. I've had that. Once I scored that first goal, I remember looking up at the scoreboard and thinking, have I got enough time to finish them? I knew there was just a knowing. I just knew that we had won. I f- they threw it. It was almost like being battered on the ropes all and then just going bam with one punch and knocking someone out, having been hammered all game. And I just knew as soon as I scored that goal, I felt them sag. I just felt our fans lift. And I just looked at that clock and thought, am I going to have time to finish them now? Or am I going to have to make them wait until extra time? Sounds like as if you're playing Tekken or something. It was. Finish him, finish him. It was. And I just looked at the clock and thought, is five minutes enough to score another? I, I knew I was going to score another. It was, it was just a knowing of, uh, that's the only way I can describe it. And it was, the only question in my mind was, is it going to be an extra time when I do it? Or is it, have I got time now? And uh, it was just, it was almost like an outer body experience. And the, the day, having won it, the party after, the feeling of making so many people happy, you know, the whole thing, that day, if I could live, I hope my wife's not listening to this because I've had four children and got married and things like that. But if I could live one day again, um, it would be FA Cup final. Michael Owen, all it leaves me to say is um, fantastic to come here to the stables. I know that your, your career as, a, as an owner, a trainer is burgeoning. Of course, still very much a pundit involved in the game as well. Thank you very much for joining me on The Last Word with Stan Collymore. Fascinating insight. Loved it. Thanks, pal. The Last Word with Stan Collymore.